So there's been lots of talk, discussion around the PlayStation 5 before it launched, during its lifespan over the past three years, and just how impactful and integral the SSD and the IO subsystem is within the console, which was a big part of its announcement when it came out, and a big push from Mark Cerny in his road to PlayStation 5. Now thanks to Insomniac's ports over to PC in Spider-Man, and now in the biggest one of them all, Ratchet & Clank Rift Apart, which was a current generation exclusive, delivered gameplay that simply wasn't possible at this level on the previous generation. But before we raid the technology and data banks to find out just what this means for PC and console, let's take a raid of another kind with this video sponsor. But before all that, in a surreal event of being locked indoors, a perfect antithesis to the boredom that can set in is Raid Shadow Legends. It's a hark back to the old Dungeons and Dragons of days gone by, but this time rather than whacking out a board and playing for hours, you can simply whack out your phone or PC and play on the go or wherever you may be. But just make sure you're in a safe place to do so. The title offers over 700 unique champions, 15 awesome factions, 12 imposing dungeons to conquer, engaging PvP combat, regular content updates you can play on your mobile and desktop, and endless customization across all your characters. You can even pop into a tavern and sacrifice them to get the best value out of each life. With over 400 billion players across 190 countries, you'll never be short of people to play against and lose against. Even death doesn't get you out of the battle, with new boss Akamurai the Phantom Shogun hiding greater upgrades than ever before. And if all that doesn't get you geared up for battle, then using the link in my description or the QR code on screen, you can get additional bonuses, including Epic Champion Telia and other Energy Refill, Skill Tome and XP boosters. So scan the QR code or click the link below and download and make your legend a reality. So kicking things off and following my launch day first look video, I've now played a few more hours of the Nixis port. And it's an incredibly impressive, as I noted then, in terms of delivery to PC and maximizing the hardware on tap from a PlayStation 5 exclusive, which would have been designed around that hardware specifically. At that point, pre-hardware, before it was even launched. Now, not only does it scale above the PlayStation 5, if you have the PC hardware, both in resolution and settings for ray trace shadows and ambient occlusion, it also scales right down to the Steam Deck, and you can now enjoy a true on-the-go Ratchet & Clank title in your hands. Nothing is lost in the old-school 3D shooter come platforming adventure, and the quality and effort of the transition is borne out by how well it can run so long as you have the relevant hardware or make the relevant compromises. I will have a fuller, deeper dive into the visual quality, how well it runs across a wide range of hardware on IGN next week, but here I wanted to cover the comparisons to a perceived equal spec machine in my RTX 2070, what settings to use on the Steam Deck and PC, and go even deeper into just how the game uses the hardware and what this means for the PC platform as a whole now that the PlayStation 5 IO and SSD system is becoming more and more prevalent, certainly in regards to exclusives. So let's start with the Steam Deck and the two options you have to run the game, the internal SSD and an SD card. Here I'm using a Samsung Evo 256GB card which maxes out with an approximate 130 megabytes per second read speeds, but it's likely below that in the real world case. This puts it close to an old mechanical hard drive speeds, but it have much faster seek thus latency time for that drive, but it could actually have lower read and thus bandwidth levels during the game. The internal SSD offers, again theoretically, speeds of approximately 2GB per second, but it's likely much lower, but should exceed the SD card and a mechanical drive in both cases, in terms of bandwidth, read speed and certainly latency. That seek time is the most important aspect of these drives. I covered this in depth a few years ago, so go and check out my next generation hard drives SSD talk and video, link is down below. So here, using the Rift Rail section from the start of the game, we can see the difference between these two drives can deliver some huge deltas. In terms of overall performance in like-for-like -like settings, there's not a massive difference, somewhere between 5 and 10% at certain points in favour of the SSD, and sometimes in favour of the SD card, margin of error and all of that. But fundamentally, what we are seeing is a much faster delivery of the same section. It streams the data quicker and goes into the first rift much faster on the SSD because the seat times and bandwidth are far higher. 
Now this can cause scenarios where the faster drive can put more pressure on the CPU and GPU to decompress the data whilst rendering the game as more data is hitting it within the same time. The opposite can also happen where the slower drive then starts to lag behind and the engine appears to try and play catch up so it begins streaming data sooner than the other. Fundamentally, in this test section here, it washes its face as the Steam Deck is heavily bandwidth and GPU bound beyond the drive itself, and as such, the LPDDR RAM is likely another big bottleneck for the system during these moments when targeting such a fast level of data streaming. Now we can see the game seems to allocate a large page file on the drive to virtualize more VRAM than is present, with it using 8GB maximum within the operating system, so the system is likely page swapping alongside everything else here. That said, the results at these low settings with a 720p target using either FSR2 or Insomniac's own temporal injection are very impressive. But it obviously could not render high quality textures, more geometry and ray tracing with it already being maxed out here. I also note that that 30 FPS is the target you should be running this on this machine, that's where it needs to sit, but I'm using 60 FPS here for my test to make sure that we get the best bang for buck to compare against other machines and itself. Again, we're going to a dimension where I always win, so you can finally know how it feels. So collating our tests here, the results clearly demonstrate that the drive is only a small part of the game's equation. The SD card delivered almost identical performance and 1 and 5% lows with a 4 and 25% improvement on frame time and frame rate lows. But without this test, they would be similar. However, the SSD delivered the closer level of the developer's aims with it streaming into each world upwards of 10 seconds faster and bigger more impactful sections later in the game also turn up. Such as this boss battle here a little further on which can see some big impacts on all tested hardware in this video. Realistically you should run this from the SSD but if you have the smaller 64GB Steam Deck then an SD card like this or a faster one could deliver better performance but the long delays between these rifts and other fast moving streaming sections could be slower than on the internal drive. All that said, the Steam Deck at my recommended settings here, which are really just low across the board with medium textures and a 30 FPS cap at 900p using temporal injection or FSR2, as long as you turn the sharpening down a little, does provide a superb way to enjoy this now two year old game, but you would not know it as it feels at times still far ahead of the pack. Help you get into Nefarious Tower. It's the only place in the city you're gonna find a Royal Starship. What's so special about the blimp? Just find a way up to that rooftop. I gotta grab my gear. Now next up is my RTX 2070, which is paired with 16 gigabytes of DDR4 RAM and a Zen 2700 at 3.8 gigahertz, overclocked overall, offering nine teraflops and 454 gigabytes per second bandwidth. We have a good machine to represent a good PC spec across the market. And as noted, Nixes had used Direct Storage 1.2 to enable a buffered and unbuffered streaming of data from the drive to RAM. Now the option here means both use compressed data which comes off the drive and then is shipped into system RAM and then this is then moved into VRAM and finally decompressed as the GPU needs it. Now depending on your GPU and the settings within the game, effectively textures above low most likely trigger this, then the GPU decompresses this data as it needs, reducing the CPU workload over other titles, including Spider-Man. If you don't have this, then the CPU has to do the work, and that has another knock-on effect, as that is not as quick and efficient as the GPU doing it. But as I noted before though, once you move this work to the GPU, yes, you do remove work off the CPU, but it doesn't come free for the GPU either, and it can impact the game's performance, as it then has to become a compute job in the queue, and then then has to fit in within its rendering work, and it will also utilize more bandwidth on the system. Now, quick summary, the PS5 has only a single pool of GDDR RAM, so it only has to copy it once from the drive, and it is then decompressed for use for the GPU as it needs it, by the dedicated hardware in that console. So none of this copy, request, move, deflate, impacts the CPU or GPU on the console. The PlayStation 5 does all that for free. It only affects bandwidth. But on PC, not only does all this have to be done by the CPU and now the GPU, but it is also done twice. The perfect scenario will come later 
when PC hardware is updated to mimic the PS5 and offer drive to VRAM Direct, which would help out some of the issues here, and I mentioned this a few years ago in my reviews. The other option is to push system RAM up, which really, this game really demands 16 gigabytes minimum system RAM, but you could effectively use that as a large pool of data. 32 gigabytes, for example, could theoretically fit this entire game in, as it is only around 32 gigabytes install space. Now, the long and short of all this, though, is hard drives can be used. Yes, even at low settings here with 900p TAA, no ray tracing, the game is borderline unplayable at this point. I must stress that closed off sections and quieter exploration is still very good in the title, even on a hard drive, but even the menu can become very slow and cumbersome using a hard drive. My 7200 RPM drive here is actually pretty good. It tested out at 126 megabytes per second read speed, helped by a small 64 megabyte cache the drive has, which can help out on occasion. But as you've already seen here, the hit to performance is far too great. And although it does play on a hard drive, the quality of the game, the aims of the developers in both performance and delays is far too large. Plus, you'll also see bigger impacts to texture streaming in late, although the 8GB of VRAM on my 2070 also plays a part here, even at 1080p levels with ray tracing off. You can use a hard drive, but it doesn't mean you should, and I recommend that you don't. You should at least use a SATA SSD, or even better, an NVMe drive such as the MP600, the Rocket 4, or Samsung Pro I covered a few years back on my PS5 SSD upgrade video. So let's get into comparing these then. So comparing the hard drive to the SD card and the Steam Deck itself, we can see that it holds back this machine significantly with similar hangs and performance dips as the CPU and GPU are simply waiting around too often for data. Once my SSD is used, again offering as tested here, five times the read speed and bandwidth of nearly 600 megabytes per second, we see huge improvements in these like-for-like -like sections. 81% increase in frame rate lows, a staggering 1000% increase in frame time lows, going from a worst case scenario of 783 milliseconds down to a worst case of 83 milliseconds. 1% lows are almost 400% faster, and although average is within 5 to 8% of each other, the gameplay quality, the presentation, and speed is night and day. But again, we can see that there is more here than just the drive speed. Now, as I covered in depth in my Spider-Man PC review, the Insomniac engine can exceed even the PCIe 3 16 times limit of near 16 gigabytes per second bandwidth. And unsurprisingly, this game is even higher and more frequent than that. Now, the only card I have with a PCIe 4 port is my RX 6800, and I cannot test that at the moment, or at least at maximum levels, as AMD currently has ray tracing disabled for now until it comes in a later patch. But I can show you the impact as I did before, by forcing my RTX 2070 down to an older 8 gigabytes per second limit compared to the full 16 gigabytes. Again, we see huge gains of 60% in frame rate lows and a monstrous 200% decrease in frame time highs. And this affects the game throughout and not just in these streaming sections, showing you how much data is being consumed here from both the CPU and the GPU on that system RAM and VRAM we see a 100% improvement in both 1% and 5% lows, which offer a far more consistent play quality. And on average, we actually gain 36% performance on average in these like-for-like -like settings using match settings, as best I can anyway, to the PS5's performance RT mode, using DLSS DRS to a ceiling of 1440p, and it can drop often in my counts to 810p, which although it's lower than the PlayStation 5 base of 1080p in this mode, it's still a gorgeous looking game on a 4K screen. And aside some issues with ray tracing, such as lower quality when DLSS is active, and some slow streaming and almost macro blocking issues with them at times, they are close to the PS5 levels at high, and can actually exceed them with better hardware at the very high levels. Finally, to wrap up, just how does this superb port on my RTX 2070, all things set to the best we can have, stack up to the PS5 in this same section? Well, as you can see, the PlayStation 5 can have some stutters of its own during these heavy streaming moments, with a worst case of 66.65 milliseconds, which is still two times better than the worst case on my RTX 2070 machine. Frame rates are much better, over 130% better in these small sections, 
as are the 1 and 5% lows, to the tune of 50 and 100% better, which means on average the PlayStation 5 is 20% faster here with an average high resolution also, meaning we again see a title designed around the PS5, even with ray tracing and DLSS enabled, running much closer to a 2080 Ti and maybe even a 3080, something I will be testing in my IGN video more next week. So all in all, the quality here is a poster boy for all PC ports we require, including big studios from Microsoft, Epic, EA and Activision, and many more. Nixes are certainly standing on the shoulders of giants with Insomniac, but they have not just made the port to PC as a get it to run and then leave it there. They have refined it, rewritten areas of memory management, async the shader compilation before Epic even did, and Microsoft. Not to mention being the very first team to ship a game using Direct Storage 1.2 and GPU decompression ahead of anyone else. And the results are again industry leading, with the game having a console-like boot up and load, a solid and dynamic settings menu, making it very easy to change settings on the fly and actually see what each one does within the game. I never cease to be amazed by both of these teams, and although this is approaching a three-year-old game, the visual quality, hardware utilization, performance levels, and software adoption are bleeding edge. And if you want a fun, gorgeous, Pixar-like game to play with your kids, or on your own, and really of the old glory days of gaming back then, then Rift Apart is again one of my recommendations for all, just as it was in 2021 when it launched. Anyway, that's it for a quick and hopefully deep dive into Rift Apart, PC formats and consoles. Hopefully, if you like what I do, you can subscribe, share, like and comment down below. Also, join my Patreon to help me out and improve my quality if and when possible. Otherwise, I'll see you very soon on the next video or over on IGN. I'll catch you on the next one.